Hello, everyone, and welcome to the 18th Annual Cardinal O'Connor Conference on Life. My name is Jeanette Jolly, and I have had the immense pleasure of working with Michael Kahn, my lovely co-director, to bring the conference to life this year. John Cardinal O'Connor, an alumnus of Georgetown, was a renowned and courageous advocate for a culture of life during his tenure as Archbishop of New York. In January 2000, Georgetown students first hosted a national pro-life conference for the many college students and pro-life activists who traveled to our nation's capital for the March for Life. The conference was later named in Cardinal O'Connor's honor. We are thrilled to continue that annual tradition today for the 18th time. When Michael and I first met to begin work on this conference, we were in the throes of political contention and hyperpartisanship, and neither of us were confident in the direction of pro-life politics. This concern inspired us and our conference board to develop this year's theme, working toward a truly pro-life pro -life politics. Through this theme, we wanted to explore whether or not it is possible to maintain a truly pro-life politics, irrespective of party, and if it is, what that politics would look like. Through today's conference, we will attempt to answer these questions by analyzing the foundations of the pro-life position and by drawing out the implications for political engagement and policymaking on a national and international level as we attempt to head towards a truly pro-life politics. But before we tackle that ambitious goal, we would like to welcome Father Matthew Carnes, SJ, Associate Professor in the Department of Government here at Georgetown to deliver the opening prayer. Thank you, uh, Michael and Jeanette, and welcome to all of you here to Georgetown University and to this, our most uh, special hall, Gaston Hall. It's a hall that calls us to so much. I only just want to point out one small thing that it calls us to. It's inscribed with all these great values, and you'll notice way up at the top is the word wisdom to which we're called, and which in some ways, as you look at this stage, hopefully you kind of bask in this idea of wisdom. But it also actually calls any speaker that stands here and that sits here and speaks here to virtue, which is actually going to be really hard for you to see because they have bright lights set up right now. But it's in the top across that back wall that says virtue. It reminds us of these two twin goals that we seek when we come here, wisdom and virtue, truth and an ability to live with grace and with dignity and with justice in our world. So in that spirit, let us pray. All-powerful and almighty God, you are the source and author of all life. You have made all life holy, and to you, every life matters. Today, you bless us with this gathering in which we take up the cause of life from within this privileged space of the university. We embrace our task to engage more deeply in debate that is intelligent, with listening and learning, with compassion and humility, and with a resolute and unwavering desire to know and live your truth and your justice. Teach us, O oh Lord, the meaning of human dignity. May we see it in every one of our brothers and sisters, in the young and the old, in the ill and the ailing and the dying, in the poor and the homeless and the unemployed, in refugees fleeing war, in migrants seeking opportunity coming to our shores, and in a particular way, in those yet to be born. Raise your mighty arm to protect life wherever it is threatened, and inspire us with strength to stand up in our culture with those who are regarded as weakest or worst of all, forgotten. Help us to stand for public policy that recognizes and cherishes the value of every person and that provides true opportunities for our flourishing as individuals and as a society. May no one be excluded from the bounty of our land. And may we be ever more generous in sharing its gifts and its promise. Lord of life, help us to stand with and serve those who face the hardest choices in life and in death, that they might find the courage too, as you taught through Moses, choose life so that you and your descendants may live enjoying the promised blessing of your holy people. Inspire us, Lord, to minister with gentleness to those in our hospitals and our retirement homes, and especially those members of our families who are nearing the completion of their natural lives. Shed the light of your face on them 
and allow us to bask in the radiance of their lives so well lived. Loving God, we beg your blessing on us today and every day as we commit ever more deeply to the sustained daily choice that promoting life entails. May we find in you the hope and the encouragement we need to remain joyful, loving, and compassionate in this task of our lifetime and this task of this generation. Bless all who participate today in this gathering and all who have traveled from near and far to give witness to life. May this day make our efforts ever more intelligent, ever more informed, and ever more effective. We make all these prayers with deep gratitude and hope through your Son, whose passion transformed death into life, and who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God forever and ever. Thank you, Father Carnes. Uh, before we begin, we would like to remind all of you of our speech and expression policy. Uh, Georgetown University is committed to standards promoting speech and expression that foster the exchange of ideas and opinions. While it is recognized that not everyone may share the same views as a speaker, it is expected that everyone in attendance at this event respect the right of the speaker and the organizing student group uh, to share their perspectives and ideas by not causing a disruption to these ev this event's activities. Uh, with that said, we are truly honored today to have Reggie Littlejohn as our keynote this year. Reggie is the founder and president of Women's Rights Without Frontiers, an international coalition to expose and oppose forced abortion, gendercide, and sexual slavery in China. Reggie also led the international effort to free blind activist Shen Guangcheng, who arrived in the United States on May 19, 2012. Women's Rights Without Frontiers seeks to form a left-right, human rights, and humanitarian coalition to end forced abortion and gendercide. Both pro-life and pro-choice venues have embraced, embraced this message. Reggie received the National Pro-Life Recognition Award at the 40th Annual March for Life here in DC in 2013. She was also the keynote speaker for the 2013 March for Life Canada in Ottawa and for the 2013 National Right to Life Convention in Dallas. An acclaimed international expert on China's one-child policy, Reggie has testified eight times at the United States Congress, three times at the European Parliament, and she has presented at the British, Irish, and Canadian parliaments as well. Her first address at the European Parliament redefined the debate about China's one-child policy, revealing it to be a sy systemic, state-sponsored violence against women. This address was included as a chapter in the book, Human Rights in China After the Olympic Games. Reggie has briefed officials at the White House, the United States Department of State, the United Nations, and the Vatican. She is a frequent guest on radio and television programs and has issued several groundbreaking reports that are included in our congressional record. Reggie is prominently featured in It's a Girl, the authoritative documentary, documentary film about gendercide in China and India. She premiered the film at the European and British parliaments in 2012 and in the Capitol Hill Visitor's Center Auditorium here in DC in 2013. She screened the film three times at the United Nations Conference on the Status of Women in 2013. Reggie has appeared 13 times on Voice of America, the official US broadcast into, into China, Taiwan, and Hong Kong. Um, WRWF has the only Chinese website in the world dedicated to exposing the brutal truth about forced abortion in China. A graduate of Yale Law School, Reggie has represented Chinese refugees in their political asylum cases. Again, we are honored to have her with us here today. Please welcome to Gaston Hall in Georgetown, Reggie Littlejohn. Thank you. Thank you, Michael, for that generous introduction, and to Michael and Jeanette for bringing me here. I was supposed to be here last year, but we got snowed out, and I was heartbroken. So I was really pleased when the board decided to bring me again, even though it's a different topic. Um, it's an honor to address you at this unprecedented moment in history. This time last year, all seemed to have been lost. People were quietly or even secretly pro-life because to come out as being pro-life would subject you to ridicule and even um, attack. 
So since the Roe v. Wade decision, the pro-life movement has spent 40 years in the wilderness. And then overnight, by a miracle, it seemed, there was a parting of the great sea and a wave swept our land out of darkness and into the light. Never since the Roe v. Wade decision passed in 1973 have we seen a pro-life House, pro-life Senate, pro-life Vice President who actually came to speak at the March for Life, pro-life President who tweeted his support for the March for Life and is poised to appoint a pro-life Supreme Court Justice. All of this... <laughs> This sea change belongs to all those who have worked, prayed, donated, and voted for it. Some people have dedicated their lives to this issue, and some of those are seated right here in this hall. And I would like to give a special acknowledgement to the Sisters for Life who are part of the legacy of the great <laughs> Cardinal O'Connor. This is a new day in America. It is a time for celebration, but it is not a time for relaxation. It is, is it a time for redoubled effort to drive forward and make headway while the window of opportunity is open. Like Joshua and the ancient Israelites standing on the River Jordan, facing the promised land, it is time to come in and take the land. And you, pro-life students, the pro-life generation, are the future of the movement and the ones who will bring America to the place where abortion is unthinkable. But I have not been asked to speak about the United States. I have been asked to speak about a land on the other side of the earth, a land still trapped in darkness, a land where unthinkable things happen, things that are unimaginable to the Western mind the land of China. I've been asked to speak about China's vicious one-child policy and the story of my own personal struggle against the twin evils of forced abortion and the sex-selective abortion of baby girls in China. The issue of abortion in the United States can be very divisive. Not only has the recent election caused national acrimony, but the pro-life versus pro-choice issue has divided friends and even family members from each other. What I have done is try to find common ground. The people in China are not celebrating today. The people of China are still laboring under a godless, totalitarian, communist regime that forcibly aborts women. And women are pressured by the culture to abort their baby girls by the millions. This is something about which pro-choice and pro-life can agree. No one supports forced abortion because it's not a choice. But again, this is a personal story. So people often want to know, how did I go from being a complex commercial and intellectual property litigator to dedicating my life to ending forced abortion and sex-selective abortion in China. And it all began with Mother Teresa. So can I have the PowerPoint, just the first slide, please? Long ago, my husband, who is here, and I want to acknowledge him, he has been with me, side by side with me. <laughs> We had the opportunity of actually working with Mother Teresa. We spent six weeks with Mother Teresa, uh, working with her in various homes. We spent a lot of time in the home for the dying, and it was very unusual because she was actually in Calcutta the whole time that we were there. And I remember being in this one home. It was called Shisha Bhavan. This is the home that Mother Teresa started when she found a baby girl that had been thrown out in a trash can. So it's filled with baby girls and also with disabled children. And I was given the responsibility to feed this one young girl. Uh, she was about 
three feet long. Uh, I was given her the responsibility to feed her breakfast. And this little girl, she looked to me like she was about three years old, but her spine was just, it was twisted like a dish rag. All of her limbs were going out at different angles. And her jaw had never really been fully formed. So when I was trying to feed her this gruel, which was sort of like thin oatmeal, if I, if I let her head lie back on the bed, the, the gruel would go out the corners of her mouth and get into her hair. And if I lifted her head, I, then it would go down her chin and onto her gown. So one of the sisters came by and I said, could you please tell me what is the best way to feed her? And she said, oh, you're doing great. That's just the way she eats. Um, and I had thought to myself that you know, what is the point of of preserving a life like this is just a life of suffering. So I'm admitting to you that that was my thought at the time. So the sister said to me, why don't you talk to her? And then I realized that I had never imagined that she would actually uh, understand, but apparently she understood Bengali and English. Uh, and, and I found out at that time that she was 22 years old. She was 22 years old. And so I didn't know what to say to her, couldn't think of what to say. So I said to her, um, how did you enjoy your breakfast? <laughs> and she broke into the most radiant, beatific smile that I have ever seen. And it was a smile full of love, full of joy, full of gratitude, full of life. And at that moment, I understood Mother Teresa's position that every life is worth preserving, no matter what. And she has been a witness to me over the decades of that truth. And I understood at that moment that actually I was the disabled one. I was the spiritually disabled one, and I was in the presence of a spiritual giant. And I have been bringing hurt witnesses people ever since that time. Another important step in my journey uh, towards doing the work that I do in China, opposing forced abortion and the sex-selective abortion of baby girls, was uh, that I had uh, a miscarriage. So we, my husband and I had a beautiful son. We wanted another child. I got pregnant. I was totally bonded with my baby, even very early on, thinking of baby names, very happy. And then one day, I just started hemorrhaging. My husband rushed me to the hospital, and they said, look, you're having a miscarriage, and we can't stop it. So I spent two days just lying on the couch at home, bleeding my, our baby away. And I called my mom, and I said to her, Mom, why would God allow me to be pregnant with a baby that I love so much and that we want so much and who would be so well cared for and then take that baby away? And I'll never forget my mother's words. She said, you know, we, there's no answer to that question. We don't know why. But if you offer your suffering up to God and turn towards him instead of turning away from him, I believe that he will use this in a way um, to release suffering in the world that you can't even imagine. So after that miscarriage, we tried again. We had another miscarriage. And... Uh, then we just stopped trying to have a baby. Years later, while I was a lawyer in San Francisco, and as I said, I was a complex commercial and intellectual property litigator, there was an email that flashed across my screen of a woman in China who was applying for asylum in the United States, and she had been persecuted as a Christian and forcibly sterilized under the one-child policy. This was in the mid-'90s. And at that time, I had known that China had a one-child policy, but I had not stopped to think about how it was enforced. And I was utterly appalled to see that it was enforced through forced abortion up to the ninth month of pregnancy, including dragging women out of their homes, strapping them down to tables, forcibly aborting babies that they wanted. And some of these forced abortions were so violent that the women themselves died along with their full-term babies. And forced sterilization. And the thing is that I don't think that that information would have 
grabbed me on the visceral level that it did unless I'd had those miscarriages. You know, I talk to a lot of people about, uh, about this issue and they say, oh, that's terrible, and then they just go on with their lives. I couldn't go on with my life because I knew what it was like to lose a baby that you wanted. And I just remember sitting at my desk on a sunny day in San Francisco, living the American dream, basically, and just thinking about women on the other side of the earth who were being, having their front doors beaten down and being dragged out and strapped to tables and forced to abort babies. And it was just, it was not possible for me to just simply go on. And I do believe that this ministry that I have, or um, this movement that I have, f have brought to the, to the level where it is now with the help of other people, um, but there's, there's a movement now to stop forced abortion that I would not have engaged this full time if I had not lost my own two babies. So just to bring this home to you, what, what it's like um, and make it more real about uh, what, what forced abortion is like, I'm going to play a video now. It's called Stop Forced Abortion, China's War Against Women. There's one graphic image in the video, so if you don't want to see it, you should just shut your eyes where I say, and I have a photograph of her lying right next to her forcibly aborted baby. And just keep them closed for about five seconds, and you'll miss that image. But this is what I mean when I'm talking about forced abortion.
Forced abortion under China's one-child policy is both the greatest women's rights issue and the greatest life issue in the world today because of the numbers involved. The Chinese Communist Party has boasted that it has prevented 400 million lives through the one-child policy. 400 million is greater than the entire population of the United States and Canada combined. Too many of these lives were prevented through forced abortion and sterilization. China's one-child policy causes more violence against women and girls than any other official policy on Earth and any other official policy in the history of the world. In the past, China reported 13 million abortions a year. And we have about 1 million in the United States. China has four times the population, 13 times the number of abortions than the United States. However, last year, the United States Department of State found through a Chinese media outlet that those 13 million abortions were only abortions that were uh, committed in official government uh, hospitals and clinics. There was another 10 million in unofficial clinics. So you add the 13 million to 10 million, you get 23 million abortions a year. And of course, the Chinese government does not release a statistic on how many of these are forced. But 23 million abortions a year comes to 63,013 a day, 2,625 an hour. So in the hour that I am going to be speaking to you, we're going to have 2,625 abortions in China, 43 per minute. So basically, for every breath we take, a baby is being aborted in China. The greatest hemorrhage of human life in the world is flowing out of China today. In Ephesians 5.11, the Apostle Paul tells us, have nothing to do with the fruitless deeds of darkness, but rather expose them. So once I knew about these things, I felt responsible to tell the world. Now, many of you no doubt have heard that China has ended its one-child policy. The way that this was announced by the Chinese government and the way that it was parroted by the mainstream media is extremely misleading. China, in its, announcements, in, its, in its announcement, used the word that they had abandoned or scrapped the one-child policy, and that was reported all over the place in the mainstream media. So what that does is it gives the impression that coercive population control in China has ended. It has not. All they did is move the number. Instead of forcing abortions after one, now they're forcing abortions after two, and it remains illegal for unmarried mothers, single women, to have babies in China. So in China, there was an article by the BBC that came out uh, in the middle of last year about family planning police uh, ha still conducting several times a year these health, these health checks on women to see if they're healthy, three, three times a day or four times a year, but really the main reason for it was to see if they're pregnant. And if they're not pregnant and they can't pay the fine, then they have to have an abortion. Now, sometimes people go to China and the tour guide will say, oh, we don't have a forced abortion. If you want to have a second child, all you have to do is pay a fine. And in the United States, we think, OK, traffic fine, moving violation, $375, ouch. No. These fines in China can be up to 10 times a person's annual salary. So just think of how much money you make in a year, and think if you could come up with 10 times that amount of money to maintain a pregnancy on an emergency basis. And if you can't pay the fine, you will have an abortion. Now, you might walk into the abortion clinic under your own two feet, but that's still a forced abortion 
basically you have a choice. You will, you will have an abortion, either you can have an abortion with walking in yourself, or you can be dragged in, and a lot of women choose to walk in themselves, and then the Chinese Communist Party says, oh, that's a voluntary abortion. It's not. So just over the summer, in uh, Shandong province, there was an issue where women who had remarried, the, the, the woman brought in a kid, the man brought in a kid, and so then they wanted to have a kid together, and since it was her second child, they really thought it was just a second child, but, the, but they were counting it as a third child, and these women were forcibly aborted. And the way that they forced them to abort was especially if they had a government job, they would lose their job. So there was one woman whose pen name was Ang Xiang, who, uh, who she and her husband were both government workers, and they got pregnant with their third child. They thought it was okay because they, it was only her second child, and they were told either you abort this child at six months, or you will both lose your jobs. And they both had, you know kids, they had two kids already, and so they were forced to have an abortion. And again, the Chinese Communist Party would call that an elective abortion. To me, if somebody says, either we're going to crush you financially or you have an abortion, that is a forced abortion. Any abortion that a woman does not want when she wants to have the kid, that is a forced abortion. Now, Beyond this, because of the traditional preference for boys, girls are selectively aborted, not just in China, but also in India, in other Asian countries, and actually in, in other countries all over the world. And gendercide, or the sex-selective abortion of baby girls, is on the rise internationally. This is not something that is going away. It is something that is increasing because of the increased access to ultrasound and the increased access to abortion. In China, there are an estimated 37 million more men living than women, which is in turn driving human trafficking and sexual slavery. Internationally, according to one UN es estimate, there are up to 200 million more w women and girls missing in the world due to sex-selective abortion. So what I'd like to do is, I would like to just play the trailer of the It's a Girl film. It's three minutes long, and um, this is a 63-minute feature-length documentary, which we played at the European Parliament and the British Parliament and on Capitol Hill. And I would commend it to you to get this and, and show it at an event. Uh, but let's, let's just throw, show the three-minute trailer, um, and you can get a taste of, of what this is about.
200 million women and girls missing in the world today due to sex-selective abortion. What does sex-selective abortion say? It says that females are so worthless that they don't even deserve the right to, to draw breath on this earth. That number 200 million is greater than all the casualties of all the wars of the 20th century. I would submit to you that this is the true war against women. Because of this gendercide, there's a shortage of women in China, which is driving human trafficking and sexual slavery. And people sometimes ask, how do the women of China deal with this? The answer is very sobering. China has the highest female suicide rate in the world. According to State Department report, 590 women a day end their lives in China. And in the countryside, the main method by which they do this is by drinking pesticides, which is a, just a horrible, painful, slow way to go. So you can imagine the mental anguish that these women are in to do this to themselves. And I don't think that that is unrelated to forced abortion. When I was pregnant with my son, I can't even imagine how I would have felt if I'd been dragged out of my bed and strapped down to a table and forced to abort him at eight or nine months. I can imagine that suicide would, would have crossed my mind after something like that. And also, when women are forced culturally to selectively abort their baby girls, how does that make them feel about their own right to draw breath on this earth? These things have to be stopped. Another thing that the one-child policy has done is it's caused a senior tsunami. So the one-child policy was instituted uh, right at, uh, well, by Deng Xiaoping. What happened is Chairman Mao had said, people are the strength of China and encouraged lots of births. So the average birth rate was 5.9, almost six kids per woman in the, under the Mao era. There was a population explosion. So then Deng Xiaoping came to power and said, we need to do something about this population explosion and instituted the one-child policy. Well, meanwhile, the big population explosion under the Mao era is now heading towards retirement, and they don't have the young population to support it. So we're seeing a rash, almost an epidemic, of senior suicide. The pro China does have a population problem, but the population problem is not that they have too many people, it's that they have too few young people to support their rapidly aging economy, and that's why they moved from a one-child policy to a two-child policy. It wasn't because they repented of forced abortion, it's because they saw that while they instituted the one-child policy uh, for economic reasons, they actually have written their own economic death sentence through this. Bottom line is, China will grow old before it grows rich. And this scripture, as I was putting all this together in my mind, was tugging at my heart from Proverbs. Rescue those being led away to death. Hold back those staggering to slaughter. If you say, but we knew nothing about this, does not he who weighs the heart perceive it? Does not he who guards your life know it? Will he not repay everyone according to what they have done? This is a call to action. So my husband and I sold our home, and we put down $50,000 to start to get this work off the ground to help the women and babies of China. That's when I founded Women's Rights Without Frontiers, which has been called the leading voice in the movement to expose and oppose forced abortion in China. Why do I travel the world to expose and oppose this culture of death in China? To build the political will to stop an atrocity, people first have to know about it. As George Orwell once said, in a time of universal deceit, telling the truth is a revolutionary act. And why do we care about what's happening on the other side of the earth? Well. First of all, the people of China can't speak for themselves. They do not have freedom of speech the way that, that we do. 
So, for example, the blind activist Chen Guanchen, who was talking about these things from Chinese soil, ended up being jailed, tortured, his whole family has been persecuted. Thank God he's in the United States now. But this is what happens to people on Chinese soil who try to expose these things. Because we have freedom of speech, we are responsible to give voice to the voiceless. And not only that, but for those of us who are believers, we need to care about what God cares about. And God doesn't just care about the United States. God cares about the whole world, including the people of China, who are under this brutal regime, and they can't do anything to stop it. So what we did at Women's Rights Without Frontiers is two things. We started an international advocacy campaign, and we also started um, a Save a Girl program. So let's talk about the international advocacy. Can we, oh, I guess I can start the slideshow. <laughs> okay, this is when we gathered 200,000 signatures to stop forced abortion and, um, and sex selective abortion in connection with the It's a Girl film. But as an international advocate, as you heard, I've spoken eight times at the US Congress, parliaments all over the world, uh, and we have uh, had some real successes. I spoke three times at the European Parliament and also was the one who exposed the fourth, forced abortion of Feng Zhangmei in 2012 to the world, which created a firestorm. She was forcibly aborted at seven months and posted a, a picture of herself with her full-term baby uh, next to her on the bed. And the European Parliament passed a, uh, a resolution condemning forced abortion in China and specifically citing the case of Feng Zhangmei. Then also, uh, I've spoken a number of times at the United Nations Commission on the Status of Women, and they passed a, what they call a, an agreed conclusion condemning coercive population control by a government. Now, they didn't name China because you don't do that at the United Nations, but China is the only government that does this, although North Korea has, has started doing it as well. Um, and then there are many people who have been advocating for the Mexico uh, City policy to be reinstated, which defunds International Planned Parenthood and defunds the UNFPA. I cannot, I mean, so, so and, and President Trump signed that into law uh, this week. That was a huge victory, and many, many people worked on it, including Congressman Chris Smith. But I, we at Women's Rights Without Frontiers did our part. <laughs> of talking about this from the, from the perspective of China, because the UNFPA and International Planned Parenthood have been working hand in hand with the Chinese Communist Party on the implementation of their population control policy, which is coercive. And then on that basis, I wrote an open letter to President Trump, which was three pages single space type that was published on December 1st, saying why he should defund International Planned Parenthood, and I joined everybody else in my great joy that he actually did that. He's definitely a man of action. <laughs> so I, I'll take that applause as being for President Trump and all, everybody who worked on this, and not for me personally, because I don't want to take credit for all of that. But anyway, I've, I've had some amazing experiences. So here I am advocating in congressional testimony for, for Chen Guangchen, who was, was released and got, made his way over to the United States and is now one of my best friends. I was on the Raymond Arroyo show, uh, Brian Patrick, Glenn Beck. <laughs> NPR interviewed me once, wow. <laughs> Voice of America, I met Pope Francis. <laughs> you see, you think you're giving everything up by selling your home and starting some, you know, but the guy just blesses you incredibly when you're in his will. It's, it's amazing. So that's our international advocacy campaign. And then we have our Save a Girl campaign where we have boots on the ground in one area of China and we have saved more than 200 baby girls. So what we do is this, we have field workers and we actually have um, relationships with the local Red Cross Hospital and the local clinics with officials who under the radar screen secretly when a woman comes in and has an ultrasound 
and sees that she's pregnant with a girl and then schedules herself an abortion, they'll call us because they actually agree with what we're doing. See, now this is the thing. People think that the Chinese Communist Party is, is monolithic. They're not. There are people inside the party who actually agree with what we're doing here, and they just turn a blind eye to us. We've never had an encounter with family planning police or anyone else. So uh, we will go to the woman's door and say, please do not abort or abandon your baby because she's a girl. She's a precious daughter. She will bring you much joy, and we will give you a monthly stipend for a year to empower you to keep your daughter. And what that does is two things. Number one, these women, their whole culture is saying abort that girl, especially a second daughter. Second daughters are extremely vulnerable, even under the two-child policy. Because if the first kid is a girl, many people regard that second child as being their last chance to have a boy, which is why the move from a one-child policy to a two-child policy will not end gendercide in China. So they've never heard someone say, don't abort your baby. And these women don't want to abort their daughters. So they, 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 they're hungry to hear this message coming from across the world. Don't do this. She's precious. And then also we give them money, a monthly stipend, which is not that much money by American standards. It's like $20 a month by American standards. Not that much money, but it's enough for her to go back to her in-laws, which are usually the ones that are pressuring her to abort, and say, look, I can't abort this baby. She's a lucky girl. She's already bringing money into the family. And, and that's enough. And we've been able to save more than 200 baby girls with this. So here's one of our girls. <laughs> when people say, you know, how do you keep your spirits up when you're dealing with you know, this enormous culture of death, I just look, I have a thick binder of all the baby girls that we've saved. I just go through that and just, even one of these girls is worth everything that I've done. But she was um, a second child. They had a boy first, and this was under the one child policy where if you have a boy first, you can't have a second child. If you had a girl first, you can have a second child. That, it's sort of a one and a half child policy in the countryside. So they had a boy first, and she was, she was a, an unexpected pregnancy. They did not want to abort her, but it was illegal to have her. So her mother went into hiding. The family didn't know what they were going to do. Um, and then our field worker came to the door and offered them material support. And so this girl was born, and she's a wonderful little spitfire <laughs> now. Now, this next is, is twins. So the woman who was pregnant with these twins was being pestered and pressured by her mother-in-law to get an ultrasound and dragging her feet and dragging her feet because, of course, these women don't want to go in for an ultrasound because if they find out it's a girl, they know that the next pressure is going to be to abort. And by the way, you can't see the gender of a fetus on ultrasound until they're like five or six months along. So all of these sex-selective abortions are, by definition, late term. Finally, she went in and discovered that not only was she pregnant with one girl, she was pregnant with twin girls. And so then the pressure became really intense for her to abort because she was going to use up her entire quota with one pregnancy, and they were both going to be girls. And she did not want to abort her daughters, didn't know what she was going to do. Our field worker came to the door and said, congratulations, you have double joy here, and we can offer you a double stipend for these two girls. And she was able to go back to her in-laws and say, look at this huge pile of money that you know, this American organization is going to give us for having these girls. And that they backed off, and now we have these beautiful twin girls that were born. <laughs> So these are just some of the faces of, 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 of our, I mean, I could just go on and on. Um, this is actually a boy, and we saved him from forced abortion. His mother was, was illegally pregnant and running from the family planning police, and we were able to provide safe homes for her. She was moving. We moved her every two weeks and provide money for her just to survive, and she gave birth to this beautiful baby boy. So... That is our Save a Girl campaign, and we've also started saving widows. You know how the Bible says pure religion is this, to, to save widows and orphans in their distress and to keep yourself undefiled by the world? Well, we have now started um, a, a program of, of widows whose husbands are dead, who's, who maybe their kid has died, or for whatever reason their child is not supporting them, and so then they end up 
totally destitute, and these are the people who are heading towards senior suicide. And we've come to them and we've said, you are valuable, you are wonderful, we are going to support you. And it just, the, the, the gratitude that these women have is so far beyond anything that we're actually, you know, beyond the resources that we're giving to them, but no one else cares about them, and we care about them. So that also gives me a lot of pleasure to think about the women that we're helping. And so, one of the things that, an opportunity I had was to rescue Annie and Lily Zhang. These are my Chinese daughters. And their father, his name is Zhang Lin. He is a venerated act activist in China. He is a brilliant man. He was trained as a nuclear physicist. You think it's competitive to do that in the United States. It's super competitive in China. And but he gave up what could have been a life of privilege to demonstrate for democracy in connection with the Tiananmen Square protests. So when he did that, he was jailed repeatedly, tortured. They jumped on his back and on his neck and broke discs. So he was in a wheelchair for a while. Uh, and when they could not silence him because he is an incredibly courageous person, what they did is they kidnapped his daughter, Annie, out of her fourth grade classroom. So Annie is, is, is a shorter one. She uh, was in school one day. She was called to the principal's office. The principal said, why don't you go with these nice men? They're friends of your father. They were police. They took her to the detention center. She was detained overnight. She was cold. She was hungry. She was terrified. Her father joined her late at night. They would not allow her to go to school. They put the family under house arrest. They were not, uh, allowed to leave their apartment for months. They were, then they, were, um, they escaped and became fugitives. And then they were caught. And when they were caught, her father knew that he was going to be going back to jail. So he got word out to me saying, can you help us get Annie out of China because she can't lead a normal life here. And I said, well, where will she go? And Zhang Lin said, well, we don't know. And I said, well, let me call my husband, <laughs> my awesome husband. And you know, I called him. I didn't even have to sit him down on the couch and say, honey, you know, I know that our own son graduated from high school seven years ago, and this would be basically starting over. Uh, what do you think about taking in a 10-year-old who doesn't speak English? I didn't even have to do that. <laughs> I just, I called him up and, and, I, and I said, do you remember Annie? He said, how can I forget Annie? You have her picture all over our house. And I, and I said, you know, we have an opportunity. She needs to get out of China and they don't have a place to go. And there was like a two second pause and he said, is this the Chinese daughter that you've always wanted? <laughs> and I said, I think so. And he said, sure, let's, let's bring her in. We'll, we'll raise her as our own daughter. So I just love my husband. Just stand up. <laughs> so with the help of Congressman Chris Smith and other brave people in the United States and China, four of whom were detained for helping Annie get out of China, we were able to get her and her sister out of China. And we have been raising her as our own daughter. Her sister is now 22 and is independent and doing great on her own. But Annie is living with us as our daughter. So she came here not speaking English. Um, she'll admit that she had a terrible attitude towards school. I think you can understand why after her experience, OK? Uh, didn't, you know, had, had no interest in, in being a good student and had, didn't play an instrument. And now, after two years, she had learned. We had a, we had a, a, a rule in our house, many rules in our house, actually. Um, <laughs> I try to raise kids with a sort of love and discipline, and it works, okay? My, our son went to Harvard, and you know, so anyway, Annie's doing great. Um, so she is, um, in, in two years, she, became, she won the award in her school for being the top student in her class, all right, in her second language, 
And we also started her on piano. When she came into our home, she started playing the piano. I mean, not playing. She saw the piano and just started trying to sound out tunes with one finger. And I said to my husband, why don't we get her piano lessons? She doesn't speak English. Music is a universal language. Maybe that she can you know, play the piano while she's learning English because she can't do her schoolwork right now. So we got her piano lessons from a Chinese a Mandarin speaking piano teacher. And in two years, she won an international competition to play in Carnegie Hall. And she played in Carnegie Hall just before Christmas. So here are our beautiful daughters. There's our family. And here's a picture of Annie playing in Carnegie Hall. And I just want to play you her competition video, like the first 20 seconds, two years of study. for 10 years, and I never played like that. <laughs> so again, in God's economy, I told you about my two miscarriages, right? But I feel like God restored this to me, because now I have these two beautiful Chinese daughters. You know, Thank God for his generosity and the way he blesses us when we follow him. So this is, again, the story of my personal struggle against the twin evils of forced abortion and gendercide in China. It's the story of how the pain of my miscarriages was transformed into passion to prevent the terrible loss of a child by hundreds of millions of Chinese women. In Psalm 94, 16, the Lord cries out, who will rise up for me against the wicked? Who will stand up for me against evildoers? Now, I've done my best, but will you? Will you rise up? You are at this conference in D.C., in the United States, on this earth, at this time, for a reason. In Ephesians 2.10, the Apostle Paul tells us that we are God's masterpiece, created in Christ Jesus, to do the good works that God prepared from the first that we should walk in them. So there are good works that each one of us was born to perform no one else can do what God has set for us to do. Every one of you was born for such a time as, as this. Be a light of the world. Help bring this country out of darkness and set the world on fire. The pro-life movement has spent its 40 years wandering in the wilderness. I believe it was the mighty hand of God that has brought us through the river and into the promised land. But like the ancient Israelites, we are standing on the edge of the Jordan. If we remain there, we will never receive our inheritance. We have to take the land. And who is going to do this? You are. <laughs> okay, the survivors of Roe v. Wade, the pro-life generation. So I believe that God is now saying to you what he said to Joshua. Every place that the sole of your foot will tread upon, I have given you. No one shall be able to stand before you all the days of your life. As I was with Moses, so I shall be with you. I will not leave you nor forsake you. Only be strong and courageous that you may observe to do according to all the law which Moses, my servant, commanded you. Do not turn from it to the right hand or to the left, that you may prosper wherever you go. Have I not commanded you? Be strong and of good courage. Do not be afraid nor dismayed, for the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. Thank you. <laughs>